Please pray with me. God is the great forebearer in the Reformed tradition. John Calvin used to ascend the steps to the pulpit in Geneva. He would continually mutter under his breath, Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. And so our prayers echo his prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. For unless you come, unless you show up, these words remain as black letters on the white pages of our Bibles. But if you show up, we know there is potential, power, for these words to leap off the pages into our hearts and minds. And so God, when they leap, may they find ready soil. Soil that's been made ready by your Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Continuing our sermon series uh, through the book of Ruth, you may remember that uh, several weeks ago we began with the story of Ruth, a story that does not begin with the most hopeful of pictures, a story that begins with Elimelech, a patriarch married to Naomi, and they have two sons, Malon and Kilion. They live in, uh, in Israel and they are forced, they're driven out, they move to Moab because there's a famine in the land. While in Moab, Elimelech, the patriarch, the leader of the family, the provider for the family, dies. And Naomi is left with her two sons. These two sons take Moabite wives. Uh, Malon and Kilion marry Orpah and Ruth. And after about ten years of living in Moab, both Malon and Kilion also die. And what's so troubling in our story is that they die before they are able to provide offspring. And so we find ourselves with a story that begins with three widows, a famine, and anarchy. Not exactly the most hopeful picture. And yet it's after this that Naomi hears that God has begun to provide food for God's people back in Israel. And so Naomi decides to pick up stakes to go back home. Her two daughters-in-law decide to go with her. And on their way... Uh, the two daughters-in-law, she tries to convince them to return to their own country, to return to Moab. They don't know anything about Israel. They don't know anything about Judah. They know nothing about Bethlehem. And Orpah and Ruth have kind of divergent paths. Orpah decides to go back to Moab, and Ruth decides to cling to her mother-in-law. She will not leave her. And last week, we picked up with a story with with Ruth and Naomi, these two widows, returning back home at the beginning of the barley harvest. And Elizabeth shared with us that it seems at this point in the story, when a story that's so full of so many endings, uh, that there's this hopeful note at the beginning of the barley harvest. How God takes old endings and because of God's redemptive work, brings about new beginnings. And so we pick up today with Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. Uh, listen for the word of the Lord. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, go my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers said, She is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came, and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, 
Go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have you taken notice of, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother in law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, may I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I'm not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves, and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles, and leave them for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She picked it up and came into the town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself was satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, it is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, otherwise you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my mom was a Rosaboom, R-O-O-Z-E-B-O-O-M. Four O's, a Z, not an S, no N. Rosaboom, like the Dutch, and hence God so intended. Rosaboom. <laughs> It was 48 years ago this month that, that my grandfather, John William Rosaboom, dropped dead while working at a meat locker in Lytton, Iowa. He was 44 years old. My grandma at the time was 42, my mom 18, my uncle 15, my aunt 9. And in late 1960s, this was not exactly the easiest situation. It was a shock to the community. My grandfather served as an elder at the Lighten Christian Reformed Church, my home congregation. He served on the school board of the Pella Christian Grade School, and he owned a meat locker in Lighten. It was a significant loss for our family. All throughout growing up, my mom would reflect on that. She she wasn't able to tell us a lot about my grandfather simply because every time she tried to do so, she would be overcome with emotion. So I heard stories, mostly from church people, people that knew my grandpa, people that knew that he was a fun-loving, jovial, prankster, jokester kind of person. And yet my mother would tell me every so often, my brothers and I would tell us every so often about the things she remembered about that fateful Friday in April of 1968. It's interesting to me that what she would remember were things that people said to her or to her family in the midst of this unspeakable loss. Things that really weren't helpful but were more hurtful. Things that as she processed them caused her to wonder if people really did understand what it was like to lose a loved one. As I think about it, I wonder, don't you, whether Naomi and Ruth and Orpah had to hear those kinds of things? As they stood in the funeral home back in Moab, 
stood at the heads of the caskets of their dead husbands. I wonder what kinds of things people said to them when they came through the family visitation line. You know the things that people say. Oh, your loved one looks to be peacefully sleeping. Or things like, you know what it says in Romans, God works for the good of those who love Him. In all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Or that one in in 1 Corinthians 10, totally extrapolated out of the context in which it's spoken. You know, God will never give you more than you can handle. Or perhaps they said things like, at least you had a few good years together. I wonder what kinds of things Naomi and Orpah and Ruth had to hear And I wonder if those things were tracking in their minds as they entered back into into Bethlehem, back into Judah, back into their home country. These two women, without husbands, without sustenance, without a way to survive. This morning we'll find how God shows up in the midst of their unspeakable tragedy. We'll find out through risk-taking Ruth, benevolent Boaz, and the never-forsaking God. Our story begins with the narrator telling us about Naomi's kinsman, a kinsman named Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. This narrator introduces this character because he's going to play such a prominent role in the story. But immediately after doing so, the narrator tells us that Ruth the Moabite says to her mother-in-law, to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. Of course, this isn't the first risk that Ruth has taken. I mean, Ruth took a risk when she chose to marry an Israelite boy. Ruth took a risk when her mother-in-law decided to return to Bethlehem, she chose to fix herself to her mother-in-law, even though she was going to a place and a people and a culture and customs that she was entirely unfamiliar with. But here we see Ruth taking another risk. As it turns out, Ruth knows her Hebrew Bible. She knows about the Levitical laws and the Deuteronomic code. What is it that God says again in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10? When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. Now read this with me. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Again, Leviticus 23. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 24, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, therefore I am commanding you to do this. Do you think our God has a heart for the poor and the oppressed? Do you think our God has a heart for the stranger and the alien? Do you think our God has a heart for refugees, for people without homes? You see, Ruth knows this. Ruth knows that it is Israelite practice that very intentionally God has written it in to Levitical law and to Deuteronomic code that the people of Israel shall leave some of their harvest for the poor and the oppressed. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Next October when the farmers are out harvesting, they just left the ends of all the rows for all the poor and the oppressed. Quite a picture. Ruth takes risks. She knows This story, she knows that the people of Israel provide for those whom God calls them to provide for. But that's not the only risk. There's a risk that Ruth takes by going out to these fields because, well, she's a Moabite. 
Over and again throughout the story, we hear about Ruth being a Moabite, or being from Moab, or being a foreigner, or being one who is not included into the community of faith in Judah, in Bethlehem. Over and again, we read about how Ruth feels like she is excluded on the outside. Ruth the Moabite. And here's what's more, Moabites and Israelites didn't exactly have the best of relationships. These were competing kingdoms. These were nations, particularly in the times when the judges ruled, these were nations that were often at war with each other. Ruth takes a risk. She decides to go out to the field. And she decides to go out to the field as a Moabite. She has no husband. She has no children. Her only protector is her mother-in-law, Naomi, who really has nothing of substance to offer her. But notice how the story is told. She asks her mother-in-law, and Naomi says, go, my daughter, go. So Ruth went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. And then there's this curious little phrase in the Bible. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, one of the disadvantages with the fact that the words of Scripture are written is that we don't hear the inflection of those telling the story. These stories were originally told in oral culture. These stories were traded around fires, campfires, traded around dinner tables. These stories were told as children got tucked into bed at night. And one of the disadvantages to the fact that these words have been put put on paper and we read them is that we don't hear the sarcasm in the midst of the story. Here I think the Hebrew storyteller is speaking sarcastically. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. As it happened, could be translated a number of ways in Hebrew, by chance, or by fate, or as luck would have it, coincidentally, or accidentally. And yet we know, don't we? We know that underneath, that subversively, the providential hand of God is working about to bring God's redemptive story. I love what Catherine Dubes Sockenfeld, the Old Testament professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, says about this phrase. She says, although none of the characters is yet aware, and although there are many hurdles yet to be overcome, a corner has been turned with this phrase, as it happened. A crack in a seemingly impenetrable wall has appeared, the beginning of a possible path from death to life, from bitterness to joy, has been shown to the readers." And so then we come to benevolent Boaz. Just then Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. Notice how religious Boaz is. They answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to the servant who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this young woman belong? She stuck out like a sore thumb. She's young. She's not an Israelite. She's a Moabite. To whom does this young woman belong? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the Moabite. Doesn't even identify her by name. She is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now without resting even for a moment. She works hard. Then Boaz says to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Notice that there's a trio of provisions here. First, Boaz tells Ruth to stay close to his young women. Stay close to them. Follow behind them. Reap alongside them. Reap along my servant. But also, Boaz promises that he has commanded the young men not to bother her. This was an age in which patriarchy ruled and reigned. This was an age in which when reapers went out, their lives, their livelihood and safety was at stake. Particularly young women who were often verbally and sometimes even physically abused. Boaz has none of it. I have ordered my young men not to bother you. And notice the third provision. 
If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what my young men have drawn. Go to the vessels and drink uh, from from the vats that are really meant for the the servants, my people. Uh, Not meant for the poor and the oppressed, the alien and the stranger, the widow. Those those are really meant for my own employees. Notice that Ruth is taken aback by this. She fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? In the Hebrew here, we have a play on words. Essentially, Ruth is asking, why are you noticing the unnoticed? Or why are you recognizing the unrecognizable? Why do you see the unseen? Ruth can't believe it. And then Boaz offers his reasoning. Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. You see, what Boaz is saying to Ruth is, you know, Ruth, I know that in Moab you have a God named Chemosh, Chemosh who is known as the destroyer God. I want to tell you about Yahweh. I want to tell you about the Israelite God. I want to tell you about about a restorer, not destroyer God. I want to tell you about a God who cares for the orphan and the widow, the poor and the oppressed, the stranger and the alien. You see, ours is a God who cares for any and all. Ours is a God who provides very much within the Deuteronomic Code and the Levitical Law a way for God's people to be providing for those in need. You think you're a Moabite. You think you have no place. I want to tell you about a God. The God of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah and Rachel. This is a God who cares for any and all, including you, Ruth. Including you. And she said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. That word for spoken kindly in the Hebrew is a word that means to allure or to woo. Perhaps benevolent Boaz is becoming flirtatious Boaz. Perhaps there's a a potential romantic interest here. You've spoken kindly to me. You have wooed me. You have allured me. At mealtime, Boaz says to her, come here and eat some of the bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he heaped up for her some parched grain. Was he doing that for all the servants? Heaped up for some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves. I mean, here Boaz is losing his mind. He's losing his profit. Let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Essentially, Boaz is saying, servants, you're out there gleaning. You're out there harvesting. Harvest for Ruth. Help her out. Give her her hand. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. Ephah, 42 quarts, 20 to 30 pounds. The normal wage for a daily laborer was two pounds, 20 to 30, 10 to 15 times what the normal servant would get. This is what Ruth takes home. So she picks it up, she comes into the town, and her mother in law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother in law, Naomi, says to her, Where did you glean today? What's going on here? Where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. By the way, the name Boaz in Hebrew is a name that refers to strength. One of the pillars of the temple that would later on be built is a pillar called Boaz. And when she said these words... When she said these words, you must have known what Naomi was thinking. She was thinking about a never forsaking God. A never forsaking God. A God who is with us always. For what did she say? She said, blessed be he. Blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead whose kindness, whose 
Chesed, again, that word appears. Whose faithfulness, whose steadfast loving kindness, blessed be He by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Indeed, ours is a God who does not abandon. Who does not abscond. Who does not disown. Ours is a God who does not forget, who does not forsake the living or the dead. In other words, what Naomi recognizes when Ruth tells her that the name of the man is Boaz is that God is providing for them. And God is providing for them, but God is also providing for their dead husbands. God has not forgotten about Elimelech. God has not forgotten about Malon or Kilion. God does not forsake the living or the dead. This is a recurring theme for people of the Reformed faith. You remember these two guys? Zacharias Ursinus and Caspar Livianus? They were in their upper 20s when they wrote a document called the Heidelberg Catechism. We actually teach that here at American Reformed Church. You know that? It's pretty cool. Our high school students go through the Heidelberg Catechism. You see, they, they developed this catechism for students who were coming into the Christian faith and and the Elector Frederick, back in the Palatinate, back in Germany in 1563, wanted these students to know what it meant to be Reformed. What it meant to grab hold of these tenets of Reformed theology. And so, Ursinus and Olivianus, along with a team of other people, came up with 129 questions and answers, beginning to end, that could tell us about the Christian faith. 129 of them. They're divided up into 52 Lord's Days, presumably so that preachers and pastors could preach on a theme one Sunday uh, and, and make their way through the catechism an entire year. And of those 129 questions and answers, it's the first one that I think is the most important. It's the one that we come back to time and again when times especially are difficult in our lives. What's the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism? What is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Zacharias or Sinus and Caspar Olivianus are pulling this from another question asked by the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, ours is a God who does not forsake, who does not forget the living or the dead. Blessed be He by the Lord whose kindness whose hesed, whose faithfulness has not forsaken the living or the dead. The 1997 uh, Emmy Award ceremony, Fred Rogers was presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award. If you're my uh, vintage, you love and appreciate Mr. Rogers. You remember uh, watching Mr. Rogers as a child Back in central Iowa, he used to come on Channel 11 at 3.30 every day. And Mr. Rogers would show up and he would help us imagine a world that was much better than the world we'd actually encountered. And he helped us figure out how to live into that world. Well, in 1997, when Mr. Rogers received this Lifetime Achievement Award, he gave perhaps the most remarkable speech ever given at an Emmy Award ceremony. I'd like you to watch it with me now. Ladies and gentlemen, the best neighbor any of us has ever had, Fred Rogers.
for giving generation upon generation of children confidence in themselves, for being their friend, for telling them again and again and again that they are special and that they have worth. It is my honor on behalf of everyone here and on behalf of the millions of children whose mornings you have brightened with your kindness to present you with this Lifetime Achievement Award. Oh, it's a beautiful night in this neighborhood. Uh, uh, so many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here, some are far away, some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are. Those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life. 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference you feel they've made. You know, they're the kind of people television does well to offer our world. Special thanks to my family and friends and to my coworkers in public broadcasting, family communications, and this academy for encouraging me allowing me all these years to be your neighbor. May God be with you. Thank you very much. So many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here. Some are far away. Some are even in heaven. And so taking our cue from Fred Rogers, all of us here have special ones who have loved us into being, special ones who are no longer with us. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are, those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for your life. 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. So whoever it was that you thought of, I hope you'll share the story of that person's impact in your life today. Why? Because in doing so, we honor a God whose chesed, whose steadfast faithfulness and loving kindness has not forsaken or forgotten the living or the dead. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. For all the saints, O oh God, who from their labors rest, who Thee by faith before the world confessed, Thy name, O oh Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia. Hallelujah. Thou wast their rock, their fortress, and their might. Thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight. Thou in the darkness drear, their one true light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. O oh, may thy soldiers, faithful, true, and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fought of old, and win with them the victor's crown of gold. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. O oh, blessed communion, fellowship divine, we feebly struggle, they in glory shine. 
Yet all are one in thee, for all are thine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day. The saints triumphant rise in bright array. The King of glory passes on His way. Alleluia, alleluia. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl, streams in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia. Alleluia. All God's people said, Amen.